there you go okay thanks a lot michael thank you that's great thanks very much ashley and uh, delighted to be back with all the plan gang and um yeah I, i'm not sure i've done I may have done one on, on Zoom before, but the rest of them have all been over in the in the Crown Plaza. And um, so, yeah, sometimes when we'll be doing this live, we might kind of stop in the middle of it and ask people to contribute. So because tonight it's on Zoom and it's recorded, not everyone is comfortable with, with being on record. So um, a couple of the slides, we might do a little bit of interaction so you can pop your uh, comments into chat. But don't feel obliged. People come along here, everyone has stressful days and nights and trying to get onto these things. Don't feel like you have to contribute. If you just want to sit back and relax and just take from this whatever you wish, and hopefully there's something in there for everyone. Um, <clears throat> I've actually changed the title of this talk um, because it just took on reasons, risks and resolutions. And actually what I realized then was putting the word risks in there was almost, it's almost like a judgment kind of a thing that oh my god if your child is not going to school there are risks associated with it and actually going to school is not actually the, the goal for everybody returning to school is not actually the goal so we'll look at some of the reasons that it happens and um, some alternative options and then some strategies uh, towards resolution so just, yeah so for those who don't know me, I'm from Kilbegan and Westmeath. So uh, you're stuck with my flat Midlands tones for the next while. Uh, so I sound a bit more like Kiran Maluli or whomever the current Midlands rep is rather than any of the polished D4 kind of uh, RTE contributor type people. <laughs> so you're stuck with my flat Midlands accent. I grew up in a, in a hardware store and then I went on and did hotel management for a while. And then about 20 years ago or so, I decided to do something a little more soul fulfilling so I'm back studied counselling and then I ended up working in some counselling uh, doing some counselling in schools and then of course inevitably then I met some neurodivergent students there and that took me down a, a long path towards maybe how best to support neurodivergent students in schools so that's probably how I have ended up on this talk uh, rather than maybe other school counsellors who maybe don't deal so much with, with neurodivergent students and of course not all Students who are avoiding school are neurodivergent, but it tends to be quite a high proportion. Um, some of the first few slides, we'll get to solutions and, and suggestions down the line. Um, so I have to put up this now. These days you have to put up trigger warning that some of the stuff at the start is, is a little bit maybe anxiety inducing because um, we'll be talking about the reasons that students don't go to school and these kind of things are very personal to everybody who's who's on the chat tonight and um you know there, there'll be things there that you know hopefully actually what you'll what you'll realize is you're not in this alone your child is not the only one who's going through the same things or through the things that that are keeping them from school um and so hopefully you get some solace from that rather than anything else so there's a few more positive slides later on um about maybe solutions and alternatives you know so generally, when we look at school avoidance, um, a kind of a rule, rule of thumb, and these are not obviously set in stone and they can be at any stage, but generally in the earlier years, it's around separation anxiety. In the kind of early puberty years, it's the fear of changes and their own kind of set of circumstances. And then later on in the kind of more secondary school stage, it's it's it gets a little, I suppose, darker and a little more about social phobia, depression, anxiety, trauma, those kind of things. Um, so if I could just ask, if people could pop into the chat, what they think are the most difficult things about school? And I'll just go through them there. This is actually a John Sherry slide or just some suggestions from John Sherry was at one of his talks one night and uh, I just thought it was a lovely little list. Um, so could people just pop into the chat what they think students, and it's not necessarily just about school avoidance, but what are the 12 most difficult things about school? Yeah, bullying, yeah, what's expected of them, the noise and all of the kind of sensory stuff, yeah. Um, the rules, yeah, that's that's a good one too. Having to wake up early, yeah, because school is just not designed for teenagers. It's more designed for teachers and parents to get them out rather than students, you know. 
being dysregulated, demand separation, yeah, the friendship issues is always a, a big issue. Flexibility, friendships, what's expected, yeah, socially. And Uniform, uh, yeah, more ac academic performance or uh, demand, school demand will increase in secondary school. Sure, sure. If you could just pop them into the chat, if well, I mean, you can say it out, but I think just the chat doesn't get recorded, I think, so... Some people don't want to be identified with their with their comments, but um, that's okay. Uh, the uniform lack of friendships, fear of demands, okay, not knowing, trying to fit in, not comfortable, um, due to the child not speaking, yeah. Um, other children don't want to play with him, yeah. School demands, excellent, yeah. So all of those things are are. Uh, what happens so we'll probably have covered these you know sometimes it's the journey the the homework break times can be both a blessing and a curse for some students you know um teachers and you know just not getting along with them personality clashes um the assembly corridors clashes with classmates homework sometimes they don't like having to do those one-to-ones um just put myself on speaker view, right? And um, having to do the group work projects, tasks. I just took a quick look into the chat there. Exhaustion, yeah, yeah. The teachers being maybe not not their having a personality clash there, and the transitions, yeah, perfect. We'll come to reasons around <clears throat> school avoidance in a minute as well. Um, but they're the general big top twelve for all students in relation to school. Uh, when we look at the absences then, um, the figures are a little bit skewed because of COVID, um, but around 60,000 students miss school every day. Now, some of those are for, you know, typical reasons, they're on holidays or they're in a hospital or they've, they've um, appointments or whatever the case may be. Um, so 5.6 in primary schools, they tend to have a little bit of a higher uh, att um, attendance rate, 7.9 in post-primary, which would include kind of students who've dropped out and stuff like that. You know, those would end up in the statistics. Um, and then 68,000 miss more than 20 days in primary and 51 in the secondary. Um, so parent land recorded a 47% increase in calls from parents about school avoidance following the pandemic. Uh, one student, I couldn't get an actual picture of what it was like, but one student described to me of, um, you know, when they were avoiding school, it was like sitting in a in a class with a ring of fire around them and the, the fire was so high they couldn't see out over it. And I just thought it was a wonderful way for me to just get a real sense of how difficult that whole environment was. And they had said that it felt like that for, for years, really. Just wondering if any of these comments um sound familiar to me as parents. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard some of these before. You can pop into the chat if there was anything I should add to this. Um, my friend of teacher no school now. I'm just looking at some of the comments there. Do those kind of uh, statements sound somewhat familiar? You know, if we have another 27 students, we can't be making allowances. Oh, I can't believe that she could act like that. She's fine in here. We can't change the whole system for one child. Uh, take away all the consoles. Don't make life at home so easy. All that type of stuff. You know, it's all kind of judgy stuff, you know. And um, unfortunately, the reason they're up there is that they're quite common, you know. Um, she needs tough love. Everyone has to go to school. All those kind of things, you know. It's just sometimes people don't get it. They just don't understand, you know. So um, the problem, I suppose, with it is, is that if we look at specifically autism, um, people think the spectrum is, you know, just like that. But uh, as it turns out, it's not just like that. It is more where the sliders are different for every single person, you know, and 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 it's quite difficult, I suppose, or schools would say it's very difficult to set the sliders for everyone 
in the same way. And um, there's just so much to, to consider. But with that said, you know, with the Epson Act 2003, everyone was moved into mainstream schooling, you know, and, and the problem was the services didn't follow in with them. And so the schools do struggle sometimes to get all of those um, balances correct for each student. So there's two, unfortunately, there's two slides of this because uh, there are so many different reasons. And obviously this is not exhaustive either because um, it, it, there's just so many different reasons. So we were, some of these came up in the comments earlier. Um, bullying and, you know, the starting of school, returning after an illness, say a, a bereavement in the family, a baby arriving, some previous trauma at school. And again, that could be abuse, attack, tragedy, something that happened in there that makes it difficult for them to return. Sometimes it's it's about family events that are happening that, that just are, are difficult for the student to move on from um, moving home, moving school or class. Some have just a clinical diagnosis, general anxiety. Um, maybe there's other students in the, in the family who've not gone and I suppose the student then sees that that is one way of, of doing school, for want of a better word. Um, schools' inability to provide what they want, changes in their own image, say their weight, uh, image, physical change, maybe after an accident, something like that. Um, family illness, you know, there could be violence in the home, traumatic events, they don't want to leave maybe a vulnerable parent at home and they might feel responsible for them. They might feel isolated at school and um, they might feel stupid. You know, they might feel like a failure in class. And that sometimes comes from students who, who maybe don't want to, don't want to take part in group activities, don't want to do presentations, don't want to join committees, don't want to work in groups. Um, Maybe they are so nervous about reading in class that they feel like they stumble and stutter and, and they just feel stupid. And they might feel less than others. They might be fearful that they'll have panic attacks or, you know, medical attacks, um, physical changes, their own family changes, um, anxiety. Uh, defiances, of course, or in, in maybe autism terms, that could be PDA, the, the pathological demand avoidance. Um, Sometimes the parent is in need of their company help and assistance. Um, and and this is one that we worked on quite a bit in schools that I'm in, is that sense of belonging in a school. And that will come up later on. There are two slides of this, by the way, because, and again, it's not exhaustive, but changes in friendships and relationships. An embarrassing incident, you know, that has happened once or twice. Um, I know with students that I've worked with and and, you know, they'll either have, you know, something like soiled themselves or have create, you know, been in some embarrassing situation and they're just, you know, afraid to return from, from a sense of ridicule or people won't have understood. Uh, depression, sensory processing challenges. And again, somebody mentioned uniform earlier. And, you know, lots of times the uniform will come with 100% uh, wool or 80% wool, something like that, or even 50% wool. And I know myself as a, as a student, I couldn't wear anything other than 100% acrylic. And so thankfully, my mom had the foresight to ask them, the uniform guys who, and all the uniform suppliers do provide 100% acrylic options with their, you know, with their, certainly with the jumpers. Um, so again, psychological medical condition for them, a personality clash with students or teachers. The transport can be an issue too. There can be bullying on the transport and that can be the, 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 the challenge for getting them to school. Um, shyness, uh, power struggle with the parents so they're testing their boundaries with you. Um, sometimes the physical structure of the buildings, you can imagine you know, somebody with sensory issues having to use the school toilets, the strong smells in laboratories, even the nice strong smells in the home economics room, um, the laboratories, the changing rooms in the in the PE halls. At least since the pandemic, uh, I've noticed in the schools that most most times they don't have to change now. They just wear their tracksuit in on the day that they're in PE. So that that was one benefit from all of that. Peers have been asked to present or read out loud. Um, 
some feel that school is irrelevant, you know, they just say, look, I'm just going to be a YouTuber. <laughs> I don't need to know anything about physics or geography or history or anything like that. So this thing is just totally irrelevant. Most of what I learn, I'm never used. Um, sensory overload, of course, environmental factors like the changes, you know, some teachers coming in. Um, free classes even can bother some students because there's no structure on them. Um, overprotection, over worry of a parent. That Munchausen by proxy, you know, where parents um, have created a situation to keep them at home. Uh, again, clinical undiagnosed co-occurring conditions. So again, it's not always clear what's going on, you know. Um, so somebody's son is going to convince me a famous YouTuber. And you know what? Sometimes I say to them, well, Somebody has to do it. Loads of people are. So it's kind of hard to argue with them because some people are doing that, you know. Sleep disorder, uh, chronic fatigue, um, group work assignment strips. I mentioned that. Sometimes it's just about the academic pressures and the workload. They can be very image conscious, you know, um, and, and sometimes their maybe expression is unique. And maybe it doesn't go down so well with the others who want everyone to dress in black Adidas <laughs> uniforms, for want of a better word, in their casual clothes. Um, sometimes you just get into a habit of avoidance, you know. Sometimes it's just that becomes the habit, yeah. Uncertainty. Their organizational skills, again, that can be tricky because, you know, for teenagers, they don't particularly want their parents or guardians to be setting out all their clothes and packing their bags and doing all that. Um, and yet they can't do it themselves sometimes. So it's, it's tricky. So they might lose confidence then. And then uh, school performance or assemblies, you know, sports is <laughs> at one student and he just couldn't stand the, 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 the accent of the, of the principal and the pitch of the principal and <laughs> the assemblies just... Well, I won't say how unkind words he used to describe her and her droning on of various uh, rules, regulations and whatever the assembly was about. Um, and some just have a resistance to authority figures. And as you know, schools are chock-a-block with authority figures. And that's the nature of life over there in schools, you know. So basically, we can sum this up as kind of down into four things, social needs, medical needs, educational needs, and environmental needs. And because every action in our lives, every action in our world, every action has a need fulfillment attached to it. So whether that's a defined type of behavior or whether that's an agreeable behavior, everything has a need fulfillment attached to it. So it's trying to see what is the need being met by the avoidance that's happening, you know? So the student gave a talk one, one night with me and it was about school avoidance and that kind of stuff. And he came up with these slides. So he's allowed me to use them. So before he arrived to school, he, he had the image that it was all going to be fabulous. There'll be toilets nice and fresh, just like home. We'll sit around in groups and make lots of friends. I'll be on the team. We'll be at parties every weekend and all of that kind of stuff. But unfortunately, uh, uh, this is unfortunately his collection of, of pictures that, that um, it's, it feels like prison, it's smelly, the bathrooms are mostly atrocious and, and full of graffiti and people love to throw, throw toilet rolls down the toilet and it's now full of vapes and are people vaping and all that kind of stuff. I was asking a couple of students over the last few weeks actually about the vaping and they've ranged, but they've mostly said in around 60 to 70 percent from second years up are vaping. Um, and a surprising amount actually still smoking, um, which I was kind of surprised at because, you know, the cigarettes, they leave a smell, they leave butts, you need lighters, you need all that kind of stuff, whereas the vapes don't tend to have that much. But it's really, really alarming the level of vaping that's happening in schools and, and, and even cigarettes. And then being, you know, the noises and being isolated and um, the, the kind of practice goes on in the halls and classes. So <clears throat> when I think of, of students, and again, going back to the kind of Epson Act of, of 2003, where kind of all schools are supposed to become all things to all people. The problem is 
let's say the school is running on a Windows based system, but the student's head is working off an Apple based system. And so there's nothing wrong with the way the student is and how they operate in the world, but it just doesn't fit the system. And so the systems are incompatible. The student's psychological system just doesn't fit with our, yeah, the student's psychological system doesn't fit with the school's system. And, and so that's just one way of kind of looking at it. Another student said to me one day, he said, Michael, I feel like my head is like a computer. I have about 17 tabs open. Three of them are playing music. Some of them are glitching. I'm trying to get through the school day with all of this going on. And I just thought it was a, a lovely way for me to try and understand what that student is dealing with just on, a, on an ongoing basis, you know. And um, I have a feeling he kind of robbed this from a couple of TikToks or something because I've seen some of this stuff elsewhere. But um, that's how he was describing it. And that's how he kind of feels about life. Another student was telling me that, you know, he had all these, he, he had ADHD and he had all these workers going on in his head. And it's just such a busy, busy, busy place. So everyone is doing their bit. Some of them are looking at the daily interactions. Some of them are based on the future thoughts. Some of them are stuck in past thoughts. Some are thinking about homework, friendship issues, family matters, school problems, fears, phobias, and upcoming events. And he said, in order to go to sleep at night, he has to ask each one of them in turn to switch themselves off so that he can go to sleep. It's almost like he's to power down his system, you know, like we do with the closing down all our apps or closing down all the, all the screens we have open on, on the computer. So I, I decided um, not really to look at risks. I should probably take out that picture there. But um, these are probably just some outcomes of non-attendance. Oops, I don't know what I'm doing now. I don't want that. might have to stop sharing with this. We'll come back to it in a second. So some ex may experience um, or they may enjoy the isolation at home, you know, so the isolation can be a plus or a minus. Um, home tuition may impact the parents kind of career um, if they have to stay at home and might impact family issues if, if one parent has to then give up a job um, and it can be difficult to deliver the full curriculum if you're at home trying to homeschool or fill in the gaps of, of a home tutor if, if because they can only do so much and um, sometimes the whole thing can add to stress managing the return to school if that's the goal um, it can affect your self-esteem, self-image, self-worth. And again, that could be positively or negatively because maybe at school, maybe school is affecting them negatively and staying out is affecting them positively. Um, again, the mental health can be affected positively or negatively. Maybe staying out is positive or negative further. Maybe going to school is positive or negative. Um, the physical health can become compromised through lack of activity because they're generally not moving as much if they're at home all the time. And um, sometimes, you know, if they don't get a leave insert, they might be impacting their op options as an adult. Um, so trigger warning over. That's all the, <laughs> that's all the <laughs> negative stuff, because we need to look and see what can we do. So <laughs> I suppose first is we can't just drag them into school, even though even though some parents do tell me oh, the school just said, look, just get him in the car, just get him out and we'll deal with him from when he gets to the door here and you just do that. And you kind of think, all right, you know, too slim, I have something to say about me <laughs> bundling my child into the car. Um, so that's that's not going to be the option, you know. So um, it's about acknowledging that, you know, whatever's going on for the students, these fears... Are real. I don't know if somebody wants to move there. Um, actually, I don't know if you can just go through the list, maybe, um, if you wish, just in case that goes out in the recording. Thanks. Um, so just acknowledging that the, the, the fears are uh, real and pain is real and their anxieties are real. So early action is possibly best if the mission is returned to school. 
Um, so the goal may be uh, a joint decision of mission return to school. And again, it's about doing this as a team. So um, if you decide that that's the best way to do it, and I think this probably comes up later on, but whenever you're talking about the mission, just say, what will we do? What can we do? And it's rather than saying, what are you going to do with this? What are you going to do? What are you? Because it can feel very isolated with that, that they have to make this decision on their own. And so it's about, you know, trying to help them with that decision and maybe do it as a team. Um, now, again, this is very judgy and some of the things in this may seem judgy, but I'm not I'm not um, doing that purposely. But I, I suppose it's just something for you to consider, just the secondary benefits that are at home are negligible. Um, they may need to be reassured about the school's anti-bullying policy, you know, that if they are being bullied, they don't just have to accept that as a given, that they actually have some agency, I think is the way we usually say it now in relation to reporting bullies and that the bullying can be dealt with and that, that it's not up to them to just avoid the whole situation. Any little progress that they make, even tiny steps, it's about acknowledging them um, and helping them in overcoming their anxiety, anything that they do towards the mission to return, if that's the mission. Tell them you'll be proud of them for addressing this anxiety and making those small steps towards returning to school, if that's your mission and reassure them that you'll do everything to help them through this, you know. Um, so it's important to then try and identify and then form the team and inform the team that will help the child. So that could be partly the school and partly it could be a grandparent, uncle, neighbour, um, family friend, whomever is kind of a counsellor, whomever is involved in the child's life. It's always best to keep open lines of communication between the school and home so that um, a cohesive, clear and achievable plan is put in place and everyone knows what's what's happening and everyone is working towards the same goal. So uh, school carpooling and then peers traveling together. So sometimes um, it's about trying to identify maybe a student that, that your child feels comfortable with going back to school and um, I do remember, and to identify a with a student one day who might go back to school, and um, he said such and such a fellow will will would probably be a good guy because he lives only a few doors up, and then he said, "Oh no, I don't think he can go on Thursday because he has to help his uncle sell drugs at the Debs on Wednesday night or something." <laughs> And I was like, uh, okay, well, I think that might be too slim matter anyway, but uh, that's a whole other thing. Okay, maybe not Thursday, maybe we'll go for Friday instead. And and um, so uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully the person that your child will be going back with is not a drug dealer and, uh, and involved in that. <laughs> so uh, sometimes it's about assuring your child that there are options when they're back in school, that there are outs, that there are coping areas that they can retreat to when the going gets tough, when the stress gets too much, so that they're not they don't feel they're stuck in school for those 40 minutes or one hour, it depends on what school you're in. Some schools have 40 minute classes, others have one hour. Um, the beauty of the one hour class is that there's no doubles, but the challenge with the with the 40 minutes is that there are doubles. Um, the beauty of it is that they change every 40 minutes. So there's pluses and minuses. But either way, is they should know that there's somewhere that they can get to um, if, if they need to. Um, role playing for potential situations, and again, you know, if it's a thing that if to present a CBA, um, you know, I usually try and run through that with any of the students I'd work with, so that they can do it in a very comfortable, safe environment where they can make mistakes. And usually, by doing it once or twice with their family or friends, or whatever, uh, or a counselor, whomever they're with, um, can help. And then, of course, lots of times you can reassure them that they only sometimes with a CBA, just they can do it to their to their class tutor, their class teacher, their year head, uh, rather than to the whole class. Um, sometimes about their own image, you know, try and, and encourage them that there are positives and, and negatives of being unique. Um, well, positives I should probably just put there. And so to avoid maybe, because sometimes they say that I'm just not popular or I'm just not one of the populars, as they might say. And but it's actually not all about that. And sometimes populars are only popular because they're bold, naughty, I'm not quite sure. Sometimes being cool also comes with being, you know, um, doing some naughty stuff. 
Um, so I always try and encourage them to champion their own diagnosis or identity. I prefer to use the word identity rather than diagnosis and to become an ambassador of their identity and to become an ambassador of, of whatever, for want of a better word, label, you know, um, in, in like labels are for jars, not for people, but inevitably we end up with some kind of a label or identity or diagnosis. Um, it's just them coming, coming in, we become an advocate for our child and what we want to say and how they see things in the school setting. If they can't do it for themselves, excellent. Yeah, yeah, sometimes you do. Yeah, an ad advocate, yeah. Um, so then a reward system for SMART goals. And who's ever done a management thing will know about these specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely goals. So, you know, if, if they're not, if they're not in that balance of five things, we kind of they, they have less of a chance of being achievable, I suppose, you know, and just rewarding them for for hitting any of their goals. Um Highlighting the positives of schools. So sometimes you do need to kind of say to them, well, what is it? About? Sometimes I'll say to students, well, what is it about school that you don't like? And they'll just say everything. And it feels like it's everything, but it's generally never everything. And we can break them down bit by bit. And actually, when we drill into it, there are lots of things that they do like. So they may like art and they may like PE or they may like history or they may like a particular subject or they may like a particular teacher, they may like a particular student. So it's usually not everything and usually there are a few positives that we can maybe try and get. Uh, play dates and invite pads over and I know some of you have already started to roll your eyes at this suggestion and don't I know that you've already tried this a thousand times and who does Michael think he is coming along here and you can just put that up in the slide and think all is fine. I know it can be really difficult to, to connect them with friends and pals um, we'll come to a couple of suggestions maybe later on, but uh, sometimes it does need us, just like what that contributor was saying there, to be their advocate and to set up some, to invite people over, to invite one particular student over, to invite, um, to create play dates and do cool things that other kids will want to take part in, you know. Um, and then even negotiating with them towards a win-win-win, so it's a win for them, a win for you and a win for the school. Um, and any any small bit of negotiation they do on it, you know. Trying to identify a champion in uh, for the student in the school is also really helpful. And you effectively are their champion at home. Um, and they might have other champions at home, uncles, aunts, and and, and grandparents and neighbours and all of that. Uh, and sometimes the champion in a school can be a particular teacher. It, can sometimes be the principal, it can sometimes be the janitor, the, the secretary, the school counsellor, the SNA, you know, whomever it is. Um, but if you have a champion for your child in the school, it, it really does make a difference uh, for them and as an advocate to the other staff in the school. So trying to maintain a good relationship with the special education needs person. There's not the scene on it. There's not the regional scene. It's the person in the school. I mean, if you have a good relationship with your scene, well and good. But um, they're not always called special education. Needs. Sometimes they're called additional education needs. Um, and then the SNA and the resource team as well. Um, just like I was saying, break the problem into small pieces and tackle each element. So what I mean by that is sometimes the student would say, look, I can deal with everything except, you know, I just can't deal with the canteen at lunch and it's just too smelly and whatever. So we've sometimes found quieter places away where we insist on no uh, strong aroma food. So it's usually cold or dry food that just a kid will eat the same sandwich every day. And so there's no kind of big aromas bursting out as people open their lunch boxes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's also usually quieter and it's usually people who are in the same situation as your child and um, same with lockers sometimes lockers can be horrendously horrendously um i won't say violent they're not violent places but they're very busy places there's lots of banging doors and clattering plus there's six years leaning over first years and people trying to get stuff out all in the same five minutes between classes and, and it can be difficult you know so we found sometimes in some of the schools, separate places where they can take their lo lockers, have a separate little place for quieter lockers. Gradual introductions then, um, even just to get the child to visit the school outside of class time so that they don't meet 
students and is literally just about walking up to the reception and back in the car and home and then maybe doing that um, we talk about reduced timetables as well. Um, seeking resource hours or seeking a, a SNA if necessary, if you haven't already done that. Uh, reduced timetables work really well in, if the mission is returning to school um, or reducing hours. And then in relation to homework, um, you know, and some of these things, you know, I say, and you, and again, there might be some eye rolling and kind of like, don't you think we've tried all this, Michael? And I, I get it, but... I was given the talk recently and there was some SNAs uh, in the audience and they said, all oh, right, can you can you do kind of homework, not bands, but you can you can do homework bands in the sense that you just say, look, if it's a thing that my child will go to school if they don't have to do homework, well, then that's OK. That's better than not going. Or if my, you know, if they're in primary school, they say my child will do 20 minutes of homework and whatever they have, that's what the school will get. Or they do one hour of homework a night and no more. So there is lots of negotiation with homework and the SNAs didn't realize that that was something that could be done. So um, sometimes it will be about moving school or moving within classes, maybe over to a friend that they have or moving teachers within a particular subject or sometimes moving the subject. Uh, again, we're going back to the we, you know, to remind them that we will go through this, that we are going to try and resolve the situation. What can we do about this? again, so that they don't feel alone. And then anyone can be involved with the team. So parents, grandparents, step-parents, uncles, aunts, cousins, the school staff, and that can be any of the school staff. Um, or maybe it's sports coaches that they're connected with outside or a boxing coach or a football coach who might be able to encourage them along. Um, some friends, and then some of the, some of the you know, agencies like Pam's Primary Care, NEP, CWO, all of those guys. And then home tuition if necessary, um, and that's something you'll discuss with the principal. So uh, if you need to, then you might have to look at, you know, if it's an issue around speech and language, it could be that, it could be occupational therapists might be able to help them with organisation, counsellors might be able to help them with emotional regulation, or psychologists might even require a psychiatrist um, <clears throat> CAMS might be involved, and I know different people have different experiences there. I think generally CAMS are uh, very overwhelmed, very well-intended people who sometimes just because of their resources can't can't provide what's necessary and what's needed in the time that you need it as well. Um, so we have to sometimes look at you know and the people that you're looking at them they should be flexible they should be patient they should work in eclectic manners be practical accommodating because you know certainly with neurodivergent students a one size doesn't fit all in terms of any service so whatever service that they're engaged with um, has to be all of those things flexible the OT can be great just for for practical solutions in terms of organization and helping them with other things like their date and you know all the all the uh, physical needs and uh, bedtimes and bedtime routines and uh, just again you know you probably try these but it's just maybe a reminder that sometimes these are the things that might help so maybe leaving tech all down being charged downstairs and not in the bedrooms the bedrooms are the place where you you get ready to go to sleep and not with televisions and stuff like that you know so sometimes it's just about adjusting those things and again, just rewards for progress rather than punishments for refusal, because there's nothing worse. Punishments just drive people into into defiance, maybe is you know. But but um, yeah, just rewards are generally better. Sometimes a student uh, will just need to get a hall pass, you know, so that they can get out, go to the bathroom, or just go and chill out in a in a multi sensory room or somewhere like that, you know. Um, so if they have that hall pass, maybe that, that they know they can use whenever things get tricky and um, encourage discussions about bullying and check regularly. And lots of times some students have been with me and say, so any old bullying going on this week? You know, and, and they say, no, no, that's fine. And, I'd say, and did you do any bullying this week? And, <laughs> horrified that I'd even <clears throat> suggest that, but um, that would be equal. You know, I can't rule out possibilities. And anyway, it, it allows just a kind of a lighthearted way of opening up discussions around bullying. Identify the place of refuge in the school. I've said that. 
Um, so the school needs to inform some teachers of additional needs. So let's say being asked to read out in class is a big issue for somebody and that their anxiety levels are such that, that that's what's stopping them from going. So we just inform the teachers, don't ask that student to read out. Um, I know one, one teacher said to me that he, if, so there's a particular student hated reading out in class and he said, you needn't worry, I'm never going to ask you to read out in class just randomly, he says. However, if I come over and I stand right in front of your desk, that's when I'm going to ask you to read out because the student didn't mind necessarily reading out, but they just lived in this endless tension of waiting to be asked if they're going to need to read or not. So don't you worry about it. Until I come over to your desk, you won't need to worry about being asked to read. Sometimes you need to allow the students their items of comfort. So whether that's, you know, their earphones, just so that they may have access to them, get some music if that's what they need, or, you know, lots of times, I think there's a slide on here maybe, about, you know, just a little bag of, of, of items they may have with them, which could be sensory items, aroma items, some toy that they like, or some fidget that they like to, to play with. Um, you know, something like that, whatever they need that might comfort them, that they should have them. And then, you know, to seek exemptions from, say, reading out or writing on the board um, or using the PE changing rooms or even doing PE sometimes. Of course, exercise is great for everyone, but if it's if it's just too much, it's something that they just can't engage with, then whatever works to get an exemption from um, within the law. I mean, we can't get an exemption from Irish unless it's granted by the department, but, um, you know, but they might have exemptions from assemblies or certain activities. Um, so a solid organisational checklist, and again, you'd probably say I've tried all that, Michael, but, you know, again, sometimes you need to be reminded that, yeah, that did work for them years ago. Maybe I'll try that one again. Um, so just again about whatever it is that they need to be prepared for, for, for school, particularly in secondary school where they might need laboratory codes, PE gear, PE equipment, um, ingredients for home economics, those kind of things. They might just need to be reminded of those. Um, include the child in all the negotiations and strategies that we're trying and where possible give them control measures so that they have choices, you know, about um, choices about whatever the strategy is. So agency, I think, is the word we usually use now. So give them some agency. Uh, clear schedule for allowing fixed time periods for action and rest. And again, I'll do usually a kind of a timetable for a student where there's school, 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 school. Then in four and five, there's break time. Five and six, there's an hour of study. Six to six thirty is dinner. Six thirty to seven is relaxation. Seven to eight is something else, and maybe another bit of study or whatever the case may be. Eight to half eight is maybe a bit of exercise, whatever the case may be. So again, when they can see that very clearly, it can it can really help them because then they just don't get overwhelmed. Creating a circle of friends, we've discussed this. Uh, I know it's easier said than done. Um, sometimes there's friendship programs, buddy systems, or school mentor systems, and that can help to at least link them into one person. And usually if a senior person is working with a junior person, sometimes the, the senior's buddies kind of also look out for them. And so it creates a little bit of a network in there and gives them a little bit of confidence. Um, teaching them some of those kind of relaxation techniques. So touching in with the five senses. Um, there's another one called progressive muscular relaxation where we tense our muscles and then we relax them. And we do that with our whole body. There's great um, YouTube clips ranging from three minutes to half an hour. Um, usually three or four minutes is enough. And what we do is when we tense our muscles, it sends a message to our brain to say, oh my God, this body is under a bit of pressure. I need to actually now create some relaxation hormones to, to, to relax that body. So we almost force our body into relaxation. So progressive muscular relaxation is really good. Body scans is when we do a little meditation where we scan from our head right down through our face, relaxing all the muscles. And we can talk our way through our entire body. Just relax your face, relax your shoulders, drop your shoulders, relax your torso, relax your legs. And we can do this silently. We can do it in class. We can do it at work. It's a great body scan. It's great. There's a three minute one on YouTube uh, with a girl just sitting. It's a cartoon of a girl sitting in a chair. Very, very good one. 
and uh, excuse me, and um, any of those things. So if we can teach the children, a lot of the schools are teaching these things anyway. So um, so it's not necessarily down to you. But if you could, uh, any relaxation technique is good for them to have the hand. Um, positive parent-child attachment. I can't really get into too much around that, but that's usually what helps. And you might say, well, that's obvious, Michael, but um, maybe just if, if if that's a challenge for you, if you feel detached from the child, just YouTube some stuff about child attachment and, and it might help to just recreate some bonds. Uh, clear, concise and parental approach uh, and support for the plan. And that's, that's almost nearly, well, I mean, it can be both parents involved, but sometimes a child is split between two houses also. So where possible, if, if both houses or both parents can be aligned with the, with the plan, that's great. Um, a solid skill base among the school community to uphold the plan. So that's kind of maybe encouraging the SEN coordinator or the principal to, to maybe bring in Middletown Autism or As I Am or somebody like that to kind of build this skill set of, of, of understanding among teachers, at parent meetings um, for the for the students themselves to know more about kind of what students are going through. So a little bit of proaction on that. Encouraging the child to sit on committees and teams and on, you know, blue flag, green flag, amber flag. There's all different types of things at school or just on the chess club committee or the coder dojo committee or whatever. Anything that they're bound into the school a little bit with with a little bit of 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 kind of ownership that gives them a sense of belonging to the school and uh, any small little victory like even just walking down to the reception area one day between classes or going in for the first class in the morning or just the middle section between little break and big break as they say um any small thing that they do little reward at the end of that always helps and um, of course, we're just encouraging every little small step. Um, I think these are in bigger, just on other slides, but there are a couple of kind of um, support plan and return to school for primary and secondary school um, plans. And then beyond the slides, I can I can give the slides to Ashling afterwards and she can send them out to, to everybody. Um, the spoons theory, I just said I'd throw this one in because um, some people are very familiar with it, some people use it, some people have never heard of it, but it tends to be one that's used quite a bit in, in the autism, autistic communities. And it's about kind of, it can, it can be, you can you say about your battery, you know, if your battery runs down or whatever, but a lot of times people use this one about spoons. And let's say you start off with 12 spoons in the day and, and getting up might take one spoon for one person, getting up might take five spoons for another person, having a shower might give you back a couple of spoons, might revitalize somebody who's taking a shower, might take away your spoons. So it's kind of like sometimes I'll hear parents say, you know, do you have enough spoons for that CBA presentation? Do you have enough spoons to do uh, home economics today? Do you have enough spoons to get to school today? Do you have enough spoons to go and visit your grandparents? Uh, do you have enough spoons to kind of deal with this birthday party you've been invited to? Uh, and just, you know, where, where you don't have enough, then you need to take get yourself away and recharge your battery, replenish your spoons um, in whatever way. You know, I, I'd be fairly social. My partner would be, I won't say antisocial, that's a strong word, but, you know, social events tend to tend to kind of stress him out, you know. So I would charge my battery by going to social events. His battery would get depleted by going to social events and quietness would recharge his battery. So everyone everyone is different, you know. Um, so it's it's just just a handy little kind of a, a thing to use. I'm sure if anyone has used spoons, you might just pop it in the chat there and just say um, that, yeah, it's a good thing it works for us. Or if you have a different kind of battery recharging uh, kind of idea or kind of thing that you use, maybe just pop it in the chat there. Other people might benefit from it. Um, Maybe just uh, at this point, um, I'll tell you, we might come back to this slide at the end when we stop with the recording, um, because it's more about usually I'd, I'd stop the chat here and we'd have a little discussion about, you know, how what's, what's it like for ye going through these this kind of situation. And uh, so we'll come back to that one, I think, maybe later on. So 
Um, when we look then at kind of the school's involvement, so there's just a comment in here. Um, use it for a physical condition, but that's in relation to the spoons. Yeah, very good. So again, you might run out of energy and you need to just um, get more spoons back, yeah. So again, where the schools are involved then, so we might have some people who work in schools on this evening here. And um, so it's again, it's about trying to identify that team at the school. So it can be say the care team, generally in secondary schools, they have what's called care teams where each year we get together with different people to discuss the students' needs. So it could be the special education needs, our management, parents, the student, there could be a neurodiversity team at the school. Uh, counselors, SNAs, teachers, student councils, school board and staff. Um, there needs to be awareness uh, within the school and certainly if you're ever changing lighting and all of those, please don't put in those fluorescent tubes with the flickering and the clicking on them, you know, they tend to drive people mad. Um, and again, even about the the the, the, the paintings uh, or the, the way the walls are painted, I was talking to a principal up in um, Wicklow and he has a school where about 30% of the students are neurodivergent. So they came up with a kind of um, a light green kind of a colour, I think it was, that they put on most of the walls in the school, which seemed to be the most calming. Um, so... <laughs> so your daughter, okay, so somebody sent the told, told the daughter with the spoons theory when they were seven, and she says, Mammy, all the spoons are in the dishwasher. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> um, so if schools, just to, to remain aware of noise, lighting, uh, changes, and, you know, sometimes changes do happen just on the last minute, some teacher rings and sick, and there's going to be um, a sub-teacher, but just to be aware that some of the students need need notice where possible about change. Uh, the language that's used, uh, textures, taste, smells, participation, eye contact, all of those things. And um, yeah, clear directions, uh, consistency in relation to alarms and emergency plans. So again, if the alarm goes off, there may be a policy to say, wait 10 seconds. If the alarm goes off, then that's a false alarm. And there will be an announcement to say there was a false alarm. If it goes on for longer than 10 seconds, we need to evacuate the building or whatever. But sometimes it can be very confusing. If you're sitting there, the alarm goes off. Do I leave? Nobody seems to be moving. Why aren't they moving? We're supposed to move when the alarm goes off. And it can be very confusing. So just clear policies around those kind of things. Try and identify for the students who are isolated, some peer mentors uh, for the student to link with. If the student wants company, not all isolated students want company. So sometimes we kind of see a student isolated in the yard. We think, oh my God, that's terrible. They're not having a good school experience. We need to link them with people. Sometimes they just need that alone time in the yard. So let's not make any assumptions. Um, so there's a question in, uh, so we might just deal with that when we're off air, if that's all right. Um, just in relation to not listening to teachers and SNAs, okay. Um, so uh, identify peer mentors, okay. So using visuals around the school, that's always helpful, not just for um, the students we're, we're kind of mainly dealing with tonight, but for everybody. Um, it's usually useful if, if a teacher says a child's name first before asking a question and then picking a child because some students sit with this tension that they're going to be chosen. So we would say, Mary, what's the capital of France? rather than what's the capital of France, and then they choose a child, and sometimes the child is just sitting there terrified all day waiting for that. Um, so specific steps, specific tasks, again, that's just about clarity, and that's helpful for everybody. Uh, routine consistency, fairness, um, not just for a and students, but for everybody. And, you know, students will tell me, uh, no matter how, I suppose, strict a teacher is, or no matter how, straight down the line they are inflexible you know when you meet students later on in life and, and they'll say oh is such and such a teacher still there she was very fair and fairness is something that, that that students remember a lot more than more than nearly anything else and um, again we try and use and i certainly do try and use the child's outside interests where possible when we're coming up with ideas for projects cbas group work those kind of things or where we're trying to highlight students skills you know so your child might have a particular skill around a particular just uh, skill that they have 
Um, so maybe a chance to showcase that if they're willing to do it. And again, role playing for socialize, socializing situations. So um, I then sometimes will do those kind of things. It's a, what, what if you met somebody, let's say you go down to the chess club and you're playing chess with somebody there. How you might you start a conversation to try and see if we can move beyond just the chess game that we're playing. And so it helps just to kind of role play those things. And then usually with them, um, Schools that try and request that teachers, uh, where possible, avoid metaphor, sarcasm, cynicism, idioms, or cryptic speech, because not all students um, appreciate it, understand it, um, or can, can make logic sense out of it. Uh, again, the lunch times, if uh, sometimes, you know, in schools, we set up clubs uh, around things that we know that they might, like some games, kind of things like Dungeons and Dragons or and we set up a coder dojo club in one of the schools and I set it up with a couple of the couple of the tech type teachers um, who were willing to give it a go. And I had a clue about coding. I still don't know anything about coding, but it would happen on the lunch times that I was in that particular school. I was just in that school one day a week. And I could see we, we, we identified a bunch of guys who were probably a bit isolated, but who wanted something to do with lunchtime came along and after a little while I could see they were kind of looking in at each other's screens and checking with each other and whatever. And then eventually I, I could see that they were making small clicks and groups. And then I heard that they were heading off to each other's birthdays at the weekends and doing the cinemas and all that kind of stuff. And um, so that can really help if you have willing teachers to kind of get involved in those kind of things. Chess, chess clubs are always very popular, board game clubs, those kind of things. But also just areas of rest. There's a couple of teachers I know just kind of open up their office uh, at lunchtime. There's a couple of couches in there. And some of the students will just drift in there who maybe aren't connected outside and they can either be quiet or connect with the other students there. So we're looking at, at those events. Um, clear timetables for students. And then, of course, notice of changes for field trips, events, um, anything that, that that's going to change. Again, we're thinking win-win-win for the student, the family, and, and the and the school. Um, again, it's about teachers having an awareness of different issues for a student. Um, and then awareness that, you know, students very often come with co-occurring conditions or identities. Um, and so each one needs to be considered when we're looking at, at challenges for a student. So I'm looking at the chat there. Um, so yeah, so if there's a suggestion in about getting similar children get to know each other who have the same struggles so that they know they're not alone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, sometimes we have to be careful with that because we have to try and create a situation that isn't, um, you know, so, so that they're not uh, identifying in a negative way with each other. But yeah, there's there's very, we have to be clever and we have to be dignified around how we do that as well. But there's always a way of connecting students. Uh, as they say, where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, encouraging differences. So diversity committees, diversity clubs, and sometimes it's those diversity clubs that bring students together. Um, we're starting a club in one of the schools in the next week or two, and it's the librarian is starting, and they're going to call it FAB. So it's Friends Against Bullies. So again, that can cover neurodiversity, uh, or neurodivergent students, LGBT students maybe, um, and again like those, just just students who are a little bit alternative, um, even you know in different cultures, in different ethnicities, that kind of stuff. So um, they they generally get along well, uh, the, you know, diverse students. Um, <clears throat> so again, this is for the schools, you know, to be. They need to be able to compromise, they need to be fair, and they need to be practical. And if they can think about what it's like to be that child sitting in the class, it sometimes helps to kind of give a sense of what does that child need, you know. Uh, educating the staff, uh, so bringing in As I Am or Middletown Autism is, is usually great. Uh, awareness raising, promotion of, of those techniques, again, that's what we mentioned earlier. Providing training, speakers coming in, um, um, alerting to parenting resources, you know, so again, it's about pin or signposting parents where they can get support. Um, part of the curriculum to teach problem solving, management, anxiety management skills and techniques. And that should be to the whole school because 
I mean, who doesn't need anxiety management skills? Who's not anxious? Who doesn't need stress management uh, skills? And all of that. Um, and then parents, I think, should try and be as positive and participative in the school community as they can be. And, and that generally helps in terms of, of kind of getting your child into the school. Um, so... Again, we need to look at language, you know, so I'd always, um, I'd always call out things, you know, like um, teachers would sometimes go up and say, you know, can I just ask you, what's wrong with that child in first year? And I'd say, there's nothing wrong with any child, you know. Um, we might switch that and say, what's strong with that child? What can we do to build their strength? How can we, how can we build on their strengths? Um, so one of the things we, we also can try and do um, is to build the resilience of, of the child. So sometimes it does require gradual exposure to what they fear. Now, this is not specifically around school avoidance, really. Um, this is just in general, you know. We have to have a healthy attitude to failure. And again, sometimes we can feel that, that it's an all or nothing situation. Just because we failed once at something doesn't mean we're a failure. It just means we didn't go right on the day. Um, trying to encourage them to give things one more try. Affirming, uh, affirming them for trying new things, rewards again for trying new things. Um, remind them that you believe in them because sometimes, you know, it's a little bit like, um, a little bit like if 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 you said to your husband, "Do you love me?" You know, and oh, sure, of course I do. You know, but maybe he's never said it, and maybe sometimes you just actually need to say it. So for the same token, we sometimes need to tell the students we believe in them, just in case you haven't done it. Say it, say it soon. Um, also remind them that being rejected by somebody is not always a bad thing. It's just a sign of incompatibility. So it's a thing that they're not getting on with the bold kids or the cool kids. It just means that they're just not like them. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with either of them. Um, it's just that they're just not compatible together. Um, and then use everyday situations. Like if you come across roadworks you just say oh there's roadworks here what can we do we're going to have to take a diversion today because that's just what happens um i'm just going to go on with these and we'll come to the we'll come to the comments just in a minute um again building resilience so take an ambassador of their as i say labels are for jars not for people but just to take ownership of their own i suppose identity and maybe become champions of trying to get the school teachers, students to understand what their identity means and kind of become the ambassador for it in the school, you know. Not to become overly identified with it, but just to become ambassadorial about it. Um, again, things get cancelled. We just need to, to kind of use everyday examples of how we deal with change when you're in the car or in a family situation. We've got to try and practice gracious in victory and dignified in defeat. Sometimes students hate losing, hate not being top of the class, hate all of those things, but we need to be dignified in defeat, gracious in victory. Do kind of problem solving sessions. And again, at home, if you have a problem, so the dishwasher breaks down, the washing machine breaks down, the electricity goes, and use those things as examples of what can we do here? Come on, let's all put our thinking caps on. And it starts to create problem solving skills. Um, practice the relaxation techniques, like I said, and then there's plan A, B, C, and D. Um, okay, we need to all try and set aside daily daily times for fun and play. Um, good positive family rituals, maybe like gratitude time. Very much like this week, I think it's Thanksgiving over in, in, in America, and while it's a little bit cheesy and everything, in the movies you all see them at the end, and they all have to say something they're, they're thankful for. And while it's a bit cheesy, it is actually quite a good thing to do. And gratitude is, is one of the big players in terms of positive um, attitudes at the minute. Explore your child's passions. That goes without saying, you know, and that's, that's you know, you've, you've all done that, I'm sure. Uh, help them get involved in projects that they enjoy and can succeed in. So uh, help your child to make and create. Okay, so join clubs, societies and camps. Again, sometimes it's it's about whatever their interest is, whether it's horse riding, karate, chess, coder dojo, whatever it is, just uh, that's where they're going to find like-minded people. Um, encouraging skill and mastery, okay, and help your child to contribute locally if they are willing to do it. 
Um, I think we've we've kind of dealt with most of those things. Um, there's some quite straightforward what we call CBT strategies. So sometimes if a child is terrified of something, you say, well, look, on a scale of one to 10, how terrified are you of that? And they say, I'm, I'm at a 10, you know, I'm just, it's just terrifying. And you say, well, what's the worst that'll happen, you know? And when you really look at it, it's very easy when you actually break it down to bring the numbers down and to say, look, in the grand scheme of things, even if you mess that up, that's really still only worth a three or a two. It's really not worth a 10. And if we can try and bring a bit of, because all fears are, well, almost all fears are irrational. So we try and bring a little bit of logic to them and it usually brings the numbers down. Check if they're on negative automatic thoughts. So if they're kind of in that, just my luck type of thing, it's going to go wrong, um, that they'll assume the worst. But actually, if we test that, usually you'll find, well, look, the last time you did this, you didn't mess it up. So actually the evidence is there to say you didn't mess it up or you didn't fail your last maths exam that you're so worried about. You actually got 77% in it. So the evidence is not there to back up your irrational thought. And so we bring some some evidence, try and put evidence to it, and usually we can't. Um, these are some of the things just in relation to maybe some, some kind of lists that you could do in relation to maybe a plan, putting a plan together. That's a primary school one. That's a secondary school one. You can have a look at those uh, in your own time, maybe if you get the slides or the PDA that goes out. Um, so one of the students, he kind of felt the things that worked for him were, you know, knowing that there were school holidays coming up, having a clear timetable. He didn't get the bus. He was driven to school. He would meet with the counsellor in the school. Um, he had assistive technology. He knew he'd be able to get home to his, to his um, PlayStation in the evening. Um, so, you know, maybe just identify uh, what it will take to kind of make the mission work. Uh, when I was preparing for these kind of talks, I actually decided to ring Tusla and ask them, you know, look, what does the EWO actually look for? What are their big concerns? I'm not going to go through all of these kind of things. But I don't know, when I was reading a, I was reading a, a, a Facebook group, um, I think I have a slide just to, to point you to it. So it's, 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 it's where parents are supporting each other whose children are not attending school. And... Um, you know, one parent was saying the other day, well, you know, it's fairly hard to kind of contend with this stuff when the teacher says, oh, well, what's it going to be like now when you're visiting your parent in Mount Joy Prison, you know, if you don't start going back to school? And uh, that kind of stuff, of course, puts the fear of God in, in any child then who kind of thinks that, oh, my God, I could put my parent in school and all that kind of stuff. So, look, that those kind of things are not threats. Nobody's going to go to jail. The only time that actually an EWO would kind of escalate something is if they've repeatedly tried and tried and tried with, to connect with a parent who's just not connecting you know so i would just say try and keep in contact with them try and and meet them somewhere in relation to whatever they're they're suggesting you do um nobody wants to punish anybody not i suppose the individual is only there purely for the extreme examples of where there's neglect or something like that and that's really the only times that things get legal or that kind of stuff you know so um they were actually quite nice on the, on the call it did take me one a few emails to get them to kind of connect back in with me but the person very practical and very kind of understanding and all of that and, and could understand the stress and the pressure the parents are under when when they're in these situations so inevitably excuse me, inevitably they're just there to, to try and support this situation and the process. Um, maybe when we're off recording, maybe people can give their own views around that. Um, and so we'll, we'll deal with that later on. So look, school is not for everybody. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap it up now. I know we're over an hour doing this. So um, I'll wrap it up and we'll, we'll maybe turn off the recording and have a little chat. So school isn't for everyone. And so just looking at some of the other options. So again, homeschooling is one. And maybe when we're off air, we can have a chat about that and just see how that's working out for, for different people. And um, there's a YAP program, Youth Advocate Programs of Ireland, who can connect with, with I suppose, identified vulnerable young people who, who maybe just need an advocate in the community. Um, interestingly, the youth advocate, youth technically, legally, in, in Irish terms, is up to age 24. And there is, I think, a little uh, bit of legislation going through at the minute to because of the pandemic, 
and that actually developmental developmentally lots of people missed out during the pandemic they may actually allocate uh, uh, funding to these kind of youth groups up until a person is 28. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, apprenticeships, uh, again, they're something that could be considered in an area of interest that your child is, is interested in. Um, there's all kinds of different kind of back to education initiatives. Um, you, you know, there, there's, you can have a look on, on that website anyway. It's just, it, the leaving search in the junior search it's not all the only options that we have uh, the national learning network was one that, that I found some students could migrate into if they qualified for it um, so iSchool yes I think uh, if I'm sharing I might just play this little video it's only a couple of minutes long um, so I hope I have shared with sound um you might just let me know that the sound is working for you. Somebody just put in the comment there that can hear me. iSchool is an online learning service that offers accreditation and learning opportunities to young people aged 13 to 16 years who are not in mainstream education. Uh, working. Okay, thank you. Students are referred to iSchool from TUSLA, the Education Welfare Service. As a registered QQI provider, iSchool offers a variety of courses leading to a major award at level 3, including careers, communications, personal development, digital media, maths and computers. Every iSchool student has access to online tutors and an individual mentor to offer direction, support and encouragement. Each day, students log into our virtual learning environment from their home or from a blended learning centre. We understand that all students learn differently. So we give each student a personal mentor and an individual learning page, which is updated daily by our online tutors. With the support of their mentor, students work through various online tasks and submit work at their own pace. The work is reviewed and added to the student's QQI folder. At the end of each term, QQI examiners assess the work and students gain accreditation. We believe that every young person has a right to education and our goal is to support students through accreditation and further progression. Find out more at iSchool.ie iSchool, continue to learn. Okay. So, um, maybe later on when we're having a chat, if anyone has been through the iSchool process, um, Youth Reach, again, uh, they get a few quid for that, um, 16 and 17 years of age. Sometimes they go to Youth Reach and come back to school. It's not for everyone um, and depends on kind of who's there at any given time. Um, some people do great on it, some, some struggle in it, um, but it is an option. Um, now, these are just... This is a community volunteer group, I suppose, parent led group just that, that you could link with just in relation to a uh, home education network. So it's just kind of, again, trying to support each other if you're dealing with that. This is a, a literally a commercial thing. I have no connection with them whatsoever. It's just there are grinds websites that you may just want to get your child involved with if, if, if the mission maybe is to return to school and you just want to kind of keep them up to speed and things. There are alternative schools where, you know, it's all very, I think, democratic is how they say it. And everyone, people come and go at different times throughout the day as they wish. They're legal and usually they're American based things. Again, there is a, an organization called Independent Schools. You might just want to give them a shout if, if you want to look at alternatives. And um, there's a school completion program. I think that's really only that gives funding to DESH schools to try and identify maybe students at risk of non-attendance and, and they can put in some additional supports and nurture groups and stuff like that. Um, so you could just check if, if you're in a DESH area that the SCP can be used. Um, PLC courses, uh, I, I know um, a couple of students have managed to be able to get into, so PLC is post-leaving cert, uh, and they're usually after the leaving cert, but um, with the right application, the right kind of advocate, sometimes you can get in from 
junior cert or TY or if you're at that stage. This was the Facebook group that I just thought I'd mention. It just seems to be um, a pretty good support kind of group just for ranting and support and sharing of opinions and all that kind of stuff. Um, maybe one or two of you are already in it, but it seems to be fairly supportive and, and well managed and run. Um, somebody else at another talk just said the attachment nerd was, was quite good in terms of just her blogs and things like that. Um, Coming up on uh, Saturday, it must be um, November the 18th, there's ahead.ie and they have a thing called Better Options. So again, it's kind of uh, geared towards options for students with uh, specific learning dis difficulties or disabilities or um, it's just alternatives to school and different options in relation to, to employment and courses and stuff like that. Uh, in the community, there's employability services for people if they're trying to get into employment, they might be able to link with, uh, I suppose, like what you call a key worker or a, a, a job coach, something like that. Um, there's a lady called uh, Alison Doyle. She's really good at dealing with students who are in transition. So if they transition from school to third level or they're not attending school to look at alternatives for them. It is, I suppose, a private uh, one, but Alison also is very much a volunteer and an activist in the whole world of neurodivergence and uh, runs different different groups and volunteers and different things as well. Um, so what we might do is uh, finish up the recording there, if that's okay, Ashling, and maybe just have a, have a discussion among 